Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please take your seat. We are starting now. Okay, so welcome back. Uh, now uh, the next topic will be the open category from the operator perspective. Uh, before starting, I want to confirm that all the presentation will be available on our website. And also, I'm sorry for the temperature in the room. Uh, now this is uh, the cooler that we can. We try to open uh, the window, the, yeah, the, the doors. Maybe the door can be left open if uh, you think it is uh, too warm. Okay, so uh, in, in this presentation, so uh, I'll try to, to show that uh, how is uh, this new regulation from the operator perspective, showing that, uh, yeah, we have uh, some level of complexity, but if we just focus on the different figures, so what is uh, from the operator perspective, then we will see from the manufacturer perspective and from the, the authority perspective, then uh, the regulation can be considered not so complex. So in my presentation, I will try to answer to the most common question. And uh, let's see, first of all, operator versus remote pilot. So the operator uh, is a either physical person or an organization that operate one or more drones. Uh, this is a concept that we already have in uh, our uh, operation regulation for managed aviation. And he is the, the ultimate responsible for the entire operation. On the other side, the remote pilot is uh, a person that controls the aircraft either directly, manually, or uh, if in case of a uh, more aut uh, automatic system, he just monitors the, uh, the aircraft. But the important is that he's always able to intervene at any time. So he's, uh, he has responsibility for safely conducting uh, the flight. Now, these two figures can be also in the same person. So in case of very small companies or in case of uh, uh, leisure flight, so uh, in this case, the person needs to comply with both responsibility of the operator and of the remote pilot. Now, when I can operate in the open category? Already I've uh, given you uh, the high level indication. So uh, the general limitation is that uh, in the open category, we have uh, a maximum takeoff mass of 25 kilos. And uh, the essential element is the visual line of sight. Uh, the remote pilot is always responsible to make sure that the aircraft uh, is, uh, um, is under in his, in his view. So in this, in this way, he can separate from uh, other obstacles, either uh, flights, other flights, or also by uh, ground obstacles. And uh, the maximum altitude is uh, 120 meters from ground. This is in general. Uh, as you've said, in some cases, we allow also to fly a uh, little bit higher, 50 meters uh, higher uh, of the higher obstacle, in case there is an obstacle that is uh, higher than 120 meters. And then uh, we split up the open category in uh, some subcategory. Uh, with additional limitation, and this to allow more flexibility and make sure that uh, uh, each state then can identify uh, uh, better which kind of drone can operate in, in their area. So the most important question that so, uh, an operator uh, will have is uh, how I know what I can do and what I cannot do. And we this is something that we try to make it as simple as we can. First of all, when I buy a drone, uh, it must be uh, bear a class identification lab label. So uh, for each so drone, we, we, uh, uh, there will be this identification label as seen in the, in the presentation, uh, defining each class that is from C0 to C4. This is a new uh, 
uh, label uh, that we, we are just proposing. Uh, and it's important that uh, you don't modify the drone, otherwise it will uh, uh, lose uh, this C marking, so will not can be operated in, uh, in the with the limitation that now I will explain later. So, uh, how I operate this drone? Uh, in each boxes, uh, we, we will uh, provide a, a, fly a leaflet, that is uh, the leaflet that uh, we printed, and uh, I think that most of you were able to take uh, a copy at the entrance. And in uh, this leaflet, there is one for each classes, and uh, uh, you, you get the most important information. Now, uh, we still allow home-built drones to be operated, and uh, they can be used with the defined limitation, and we will see later. Now, how, we, uh, how to read this uh, leaflet? So this is the most uh, essential element uh, for the operator to start understanding how it needs to, uh, to operate. So first of all, we have the identification of the class. So in this case, the leaflet is for a C2 class drone. Then we have the age requirements, and we will see later. Uh, we have the registration requirements, uh, when uh, he and how to register, the competence requirements for the remote pilot, uh, the identification requirements, and we will see you on the next slide, and the important things, it's a list of do and don'ts that is summarizing the most important uh, part of this uh, regulation. And at the end of the, the leaflet, uh, there is the link to websites either the other websites or the drone rules you uh, will see later also uh, from Jean-Pierre, uh, that will provide you additional information on uh, uh, how to operate the drones. And this is just a one-page document which will summarize everything. Now, b uh, if I need to buy a drone, how I understand which drone fits my need? First of all, I need to decide where do I, I wish to fly. Uh, if, uh, for some reason, I want to fly uh, with a very small drone also over peoples, but not over assembly of people, as uh, uh, Ivo saying, said in his presentation. Then I can buy a C0 drone uh, that has a maximum takeoff of 250 gram, or I can use a home-built drone uh, with the same mass, and I'm limited to, 20, uh, to, five to 50 meters. Or I have the possibility to buy a bigger drone, so uh, the C1, that is up to 900 grams. So for this one, uh, you will see that we have some additional technical requirements that will mitigate the risk, but still uh, can be operated over uh, people. And in this case, the maximum altitude is 120 meters. Now, in case instead, I, for some reason, I want to fly close to people, but now it's limited to a four kilogram drone, and we give a limitation, uh, you can fly up to 20 meters in case of rotocraft, 20 meters far from uninvolved person, is an essential element, so people that are not part of the operation, or 50 meters uh, in case uh, we, are we are using a different, an aircraft different from a rotorcraft. So in this case, I need to buy a drone marked C2. So uh, maximum takeoff mass is 4 kilo, maximum height is 120 meter, and in this case we have also a, an age limitation. Now the age limitation is not due to the capacity of our kids, because I can say that my, my son is better than me of both these kind of uh, systems, but it's more uh, how much uh, of responsibility we can give to him. So we say that 16 old or supervised. So my kids can still uh, use uh, the drone. It's important that from a responsibility point of view, I take care, or, or uh, someone else that is uh, older than 16 year olds old take care. Or uh, in case instead I don't have these kind of requirements to fly over, over people or close to people, so I want to fly far from people. We, we have now two, two options. Uh, the, you can buy a C3 class uh, that is also, in, the, in this case, the maximum takeoff is 25 kilos. And I need to make sure that there is no one in the area of operation. And also in this case, maximum age is 120 meter or and the, the maximum age is uh, uh, 16 year old. Uh, we added, this is uh, one of the last addition uh, to uh, our MPA, another class uh, that will uh, is focused on uh, uh, some kind of drones that could be cheaper bis because uh, a C3 uh, uh, we have some uh, technical requirements that uh, could make some uh, uh, some cost but no, not so much and uh, uh, we had also the the needs to accommodate the model aircraft 
and th then we have also a slide in which I, I focus on model aircraft. So we decided to, to add this C4 uh, class. With the we, have a, we have a very, very limited number of technical requirements. And uh, uh, the limitation is that uh, uh, in addition to fly in area where there is no one and no, no people involved in the other operation, I need also to make sure that I have a safety distance from building or uninvol uninvolved people to take care of possible uh, situation of loose control of the drone, because in this case we don't have any technical requirements uh, that is mitigating this risk. Okay, so once that I bought my drone, I take my uh, leaflet and I see that I have the registration requirements. So how does it work? Uh, in case I buy the very small one, the 250 grams, we don't have any kind of registration requirements. So I can just uh, fly. Instead, if I have a C1, I, have I need to register the operator. And for the other case, I need to register both the operator and the drone. So why we have this distinction? This is coming from the impact assessment. And uh, so from one side, we had the request from, uh, especially from the security agency, to register all drones. And uh, from on the other side, we identified what could, could be the, the threat and what could be also the economic impact. So at the end, the balance is that uh, if we register only the operator for the drones below and under grams, uh, we are impacting 50% of the market. This is the actual market. So in this way, uh, only 50% needs to register both registration of the operator and 50% instead needs to register the operator only. The registration should be something easy, doing online. Uh, at this moment, uh, we, we in our uh, MPA, we provide the form uh, in which the registration will be done because then the registration at this moment will still be at member state level. But uh, uh, the information that will be required will be the same all over Europe and will be just the manufacturer of the aircraft, the type, and the serial number if available. So it will be very quick. Now, if it's a non built, we, st we instead require some additional information about characteristics and uh, the performances. Uh, we require to renew the registration every three years. Uh, why this one? Because we saw that uh, the life of drones are very short. Uh, Sometimes uh, they, they don't last more than one year, then I, I change, I buy a new drone. So if we don't sanitize the information inside the database, then uh, they will be full of uh, unusual information. So every three years, uh, people need to go there and renew the registration process. Um, ident identification. Identification is uh, one of uh, the main elements uh, for enforcement, also for use space, you heard. So how identification will work? After the registration process, uh, when I complete, I will receive a code. And I need to show this code on uh, my drone in, uh, in a way as visible as practicable. So this, is, uh, um, this will be up to, to, the, to the operator to make sure that he finds uh, the best way. And also for the small one, uh, we say that can if the, the aircraft is very small, also in the battery container, it can be, it can be put in port. And then in case of uh, a crash, we understand, we, we know who is the owner. Uh, another essential element is the, the electronic identification. Now, electronic identification will be the transmission automatic of some data, uh, so the, the enforcement authority can uh, read it and can understand who is the owner of the drone and, and can have maybe also some additional information. For the small one, the, the threat is uh, very limited, so we don't never never require for the C0 to have this uh, uh, this electronic identification. For the C2, and uh, if you remember, the C2 are the aircraft that are flying closer to people, so maybe this will fly more in a urban environment. So for this one, the s the electronic identification will be always required. For the other one. Uh, it will depends depends on the operation. So the member states can identify zones, and we will see better in the next uh, uh, slide in, in the next presentation how this powerful tool uh, work for the member state to define zones. And one of the zones that can identify is zone where only aircraft with identification can operate. And uh, s uh, so, in this way, they can manage when it is required. And uh, another. Uh, point that was added, uh, uh, mostly for uh, uh, privacy reason, is that the identification is required whenever there is uh, on board the camera 
uh, with resolution of more than 5 megapixels and a real-time transmission system. Okay, now, next is uh, the remote pilot competence. Uh, the also here we have uh, a gradual approach. In case of the, the seed zero, the very small one, the, this is, uh, we have also toys that will be included in the seed zero. So uh, the target is, mm, in some cases, also very young uh, people. So read the leaflet will be enough. So the leaflet that, they, they, that you find in the, uh, in the box will be enough. For the, uh, the, the other system, so the C1, C3, and C4, and the home build below 250 gram, instead we, we ask uh, an online training and uh, so this aircraft will allow also you to fly up to 120 meter i remember uh, so you need to have uh, some understanding of what are the risks so you can see that we have uh, some basic uh, principle of uh, the the uh, information that will be provided to the to the pilot but the most important thing they will uh, drive the pilot to find on the user in the manufacturer manual where the information how to operate the drone is and the last bullet is very important to find the suitable area to conduct the first flight. We make sure that when you do the first flight, even if you are in, uh, op you can operate over people, you do in an area where there is no one, so you can uh, start train yourself, and then uh, when you are more familiar, you fly uh, as the limitation are. Also, this we, uh, we ask to the renew the the, the, uh, the training every three years, but it with the renewal will only be for the possible update to the regulation. So it will be also in this case very quick. Only for the CTU, we have something more. So CTU, you, you are flying closer to people, so some additional risk. And we ask to have a certificate of competence after passing a theoretical exam in an approved center. Uh, the, the center will uh, be approved by the NAA. And the training will be similar to the, the one that we saw the online. But in addition, you will have some more focus on uh, uh, how to manage and understand the increased risk of safety connected to this operation. And this one we ask uh, the renewal every five years. Okay, this is my last slide now on model aircraft. Uh, this is was a, a topic uh, that was very, as I said, hot. Uh, we after the prototype regulation, we received many comments uh, from models, and we had a very nice discussion uh, uh, with association with the uh, EMFU. And uh, we came out with these three options uh, that uh, try to to accommodate the different needs. Okay, so the first is Article 14. This is the most important uh, way. Uh, we allow member states to authorize, to give a special authorization to model club associations. So we recognize the safety environment that has been built by model clubs, in which they have procedures. Uh, they uh, um, they some sometimes they also give training to the to the clubs, and uh, the the safety record is very good. So the the, the NAA can give them an authorization in which uh, they can uh, deviate from all the regulation that uh, is in uh, all the, the provisions that are in our regulation. So this is, uh, I think, the, the best way to accommodate the model aircraft. And they, they can fly actually as they do today. Now, what's happening if you don't want to join a model club? The member states can identify some area uh, in which the requirements for uh, UAS are reduced. So uh, here in the picture, you see the red uh, aeromodel zones, uh, sorry, the green aeromodel zones, uh, in uh, which they can, uh, they, are they, they are zone dedicated to, uh, to model, but also open to other traffic, but in, in which the model, uh, model or, um, or uh, UIS can operate with different requirements. So maybe also uh, at altitude higher than 120 meters, and so there will be an autumn in which they, so they will manage. But this is something that we allow in our, in our uh, regulation. And so what happens is if I don't want to uh, join a model club and I don't have one of these zones close to my home, we still have uh, the last possibility, so to fly, uh, to use a C4 aircraft on a home built and operate in A3. As you see, these are the technical requirements that we mandate for the C4, very limited. So uh, um, that's the weight below 25 kilos, but the important is that we we uh, go on the uh, we provide the instruction, the information, and we provide the leaflet to the to the model to understand uh, how to use the aircraft. So, so in this way, we think that uh, we have maximum flexibility, and model aircraft can operate as they can. So, this I hope that uh, I've tried to, to show you that. Uh, 
seen from the operator perspective, we have all the information to make this uh, not so complex and uh, understandable. If there is a question, please. So, uh, Natalia, I think we can project uh, the Slido questions and start from the first one, if you can take it. What are the proposed yeah. different types of US pilot? Okay, we don't have uh, pilot licenses in our regulation. Uh, well, pilot license in uh, in uh, our aviation uh, world is something very very clear. You need to have uh, some medical, so it's it's a very complex process. We don't require any pilot license, so uh, we just say that uh, for the open category, you can have read the leaflet if you use the seat zero. If uh, you uh, you have the the online training for the other uh, uh, classes, except. For the CTU, you need to have uh, this certificate of competence that is uh, is is out something like our driving license, but is uh, different from the license in in the way we uh, we think in our aviation world. Okay. The second question the second is about that. Yeah, drones. Uh, that red drones the. The basic regulation that is at this moment in discussion in the European Parliament uh, will include the tethered aircraft as uh, uh, the, the, list, the list of uh, aircraft excluded by the competence of EASA. So uh, our regulation is not covering the, this one and so uh, we, we expect that uh, this will still be uh, approved, the, the basic regulation in this way. Third question is about a uh, small manufacturer uh, wanting to operate in a professional way and uh, who does the drone accreditation? I think it's referred to the C marking and uh, member states or EAS. So the, the, uh, as uh, uh, Jean-Pierre will explain later, the, the, most the, the most powerful tool that we have to the C marking is that uh, we give the responsibility of verifying the aircraft to the uh, manufacturer and to the uh, market surveillance authority. So there will be a process that, a process that uh, Jean-Pierre will, uh, will identify. So the operator, he just if uh, he, uh, he, saw he see that the, uh, the aircraft has this the, the class marking and he operates within uh, uh, the limitation of the C marking, he doesn't need to, to do any additional activity uh, relating to the technical requirements of the aircraft. On the other side, in the specific category, I, uh, we will be shown that uh, there will be a risk assessment that will be required to the operator to carry out and maybe at the end of the risk assessment uh, it will be required to, to use a drone with some additional technical requirements. And in this case, the operator will be responsible uh, for making sure that the technical requirements are complied. Okay, the next question uh, about uh, the marking for several categories will be taken uh, uh, later with the presentation of Jean-Pierre. So we can go to uh, the question of Lorenzo about uh, evidence-based regulation. Where is the evidence? The question is that C3 and C4 category requirements, uh, age limit addition, are proportional to the low risk. <coughs> okay, so uh, we, at this moment, for the, for the drone, yeah, we have uh, some data. Uh, we, as Alessandro also showed, uh, we have a safety risk portfolio that uh, we have uh, some uh, some events there, uh, but uh, the data are difficult to be correlated and uh, in some cases also difficult to be verified. So some evidences from uh, uh, that are uh, quantitative evidences, yeah, this is uh, is difficult to, to provide. So the the evidence the, the approach that we use was a qualitative approach. So to to try to understand what is the from a qualitative point of view the increased risk. And so, what are the operation limitations? Now, for the C4, I said they are, they are, we target more the, more the model. So, where model fly today? They fly uh, in the countryside, where there is uh, no one involved. Now, it's something different. So, if uh, uh, I'm doing some kind of uh, uh, show in, in which that will be managed by the the, the aero club, the the, uh, the, the club. Uh, and so uh, um, we try to enforce more the training, so to, to, uh, to make sure that all models in this case that are not part of the, of the association will follow a training. And uh, uh, we reduce the technical requirements to the number of technical requirements that are feasible to model. Model, we know that most of the time they don't have any flight control system, so we cannot give them the requirement for geofencing, we don't give them the requirements for uh, altitude limitation. So we, uh, we more focus then on the, tech on the um, skill of the pilot. On the C3 instead, 
uh, which they are drawn, we have uh, some uh, minimal set of technical requirements that will, uh, uh, will uh, for sure reduce the possibility that uh, the aircraft will go fly at 1 to 20 meters. Uh, we have uh, some uh, um, lost link control uh, uh, management. Uh, and so uh, in uh, this way we mitigate the risk that they are flying closer to an area where there are population. So this will be so the differences between C3 and C4. Okay, thank you, Natale. The question about notified bodies and quality qualified entities will be taken later by Jean-Pierre. And I think now we can give the floor to some questions. Thank you. Uh, Paul Shelley, RPAS UK. Um, in the UK and many other European countries, there is a distinction drawn between recreational flying and commercial operations. I don't see any reference to that in this. Uh, perhaps you could comment. Yeah, uh, this was one of our main elements. We don't make any distinction between uh, professional and unprofessional or recreational. Uh, why? Because uh, we try to have a risk-based approach. So what is the, how the risk uh, change if someone is flying over my head, if it's uh, just for professional or for recreational? We want to make sure that they all have this the same kind of skill and uh, they have uh, the same kind of mitigation that will make me safe on ground and also this is related to other, other flight. Okay, some question. Hi, uh, Jerry Corbett from the UK CAA. Back to the question about tethered drones. Um, you said they're, they're not within the, the limit. My understanding of the basic regulation as it's been written at the moment is that that tethered limitation only applies to things that are not under power. Has that now been changed? Because I've not seen any adjustments um, to that since I, I last mentioned it. Okay, so Eva will answer this question. Thank you, thank you, Jerry. Uh, uh, I'm not sure the change has been made yet, but I have asked to include, in fact, uh, the powered the powered aircraft. Explaining, in fact, that if we don't do that, uh, control line, I think, is the official term in the in the modelism, would then be would then not be excluded. So we have proposed also to introduce powered in the in the definition. However, I don't have an answer yet from the from the discussions. Okay, so you've made the request, but it hasn't entered trilogue yet. Yeah, okay. Uh, Thierry Salmon, Airbus. Um, so the leaflet associates requirements to drones, whereas normally uh, the operation is uh, what leads to some requirements. So if you use a C2 drones far from populated area, will you have to comply to the C2 requirement or to the A3 requirement? for in terms of license or? Yeah, so now the, the, the CTU is the most stringent uh, class which allows you to make operation uh, closer to people. Now, if, uh, if you, you decide to invest money, so I would expect the CTU will have some additional costs because we have some additional technical requirements. So if you are going to invest money for uh, the CTU, so you are expecting also to, to complete also the, the all the requirements and so be able to fly up to uh, close to people, but also having the, the training. The important is that when uh, you are flying closer to people and the, the enforcement authority will come to check to you, uh, you will show that you have the right aircraft and the right knowledge to do this one. If you are using the now, the if uh, you, you give your CTU to, your to a friend of you, and you are flying in the countryside, um, the enforcement authority will never come to you to show if uh, your uh, friends has the, uh, the, the, your friends need to have all the online training at this moment. So they will not ask you to have also the, uh, the certificate provided by a uh, authorized entity. Uh, hi, Just Osnorp, a professional pilot of a real aircraft, not a drone. Um, you say your identification, you have a, some kind of tag which will be broadcasted to what? Ground-based instruction will be like a mode C transponder, will it communicate with ATC? What is the point of broadcasting the identification of a drone? So this is something that we are still discussing, you know, someone... Uh, 
Is that Okay, very short answer. Of course, uh, the, the interaction with ATM will be solved uh, and further defined in the development of the use space. But of course, uh, a visual identification of a drone is, is due to the size of the drone not possible. So it for enforcement purposes, um, an electronic signal should be transmitted. Hi, Nigel Dunkley, Transport Malta. Um, You've got the categorization of all the age groups there, and you've got the option with supervision. Are we to understand that the word supervision fulfills what, in many European domains and other industries, is what the term is for parent or legal guardian? Or are we to understand the term supervision is for a person who is technical enough to take over control or look after or guide that youngster uh, to safe operations again? It doesn't seem to be very clear whether it's a legal requirement from age or technical expertise to from a safety perspective yeah in the regulation uh, we, sp we especially say that uh, the supervision should be done by a person that com that has is at least 16 year old and has the, the technical knowledge required for that class so in the for example in the case of the CTU should have uh, this the supervision should be done by someone that has the certificate uh, provided by the entity or in case of C1 C3 and C4 uh, by someone that has, uh, has passed the online training test Um, Isabel Pakowski, GoPro. I was wondering, I saw the five megapixel limitation there in the categorization, and you just mentioned that the entire categorization is based on a risk-based approach. So how does the five megapixel fit into that? So this is a mostly privacy uh, answer. So I don't know if uh, Jean, Jean Pierre, the five megapixel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's related to, is the risk on privacy. So on, on, on privacy. Um, we put some hook in the regulation in order to uh, stimulate also a debate. Basically, there are two hooks. There is, uh, I think, a guidelines which mention the need <coughs> to get authorization to fly over a pr private property below a certain altitude. I don't remember, probably 20 meters. This is another hook here with this um, resolution. Uh, of course, the five megapixel is something which is not cast in stone. It is really to provoke, let's say, a debate and eventually try to get uh, solid uh, or more solid input. Um, what is important to know is that we have asked again the uh, data protection authorities which are in charge of this uh, subject in the member states to come back with a new opinion based on our NPA and they agree to do that and they will uh, provide an opinion by the end of the consultation. And this is certainly where we will find our main guidelines to then define uh, how to address the um, privacy issues. But we need to be aware that privacy is very important and, and let's say, um, making sure that uh, third party citizens have the possibility and feel comfortable with uh, drones and they have uh, the means to enforce their privacy, um, their privacy um, right is very important for the acceptability of the drones. So that's the okay, answer. Jean-Pierre, this is a very good transition to your presentation. I think it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Natalia. <laughs> okay, so thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so now let's take the uh, another perspective, the perspective of the manufacturer, and let's look to, uh, let's look to the... Um, Let's look to the uh, requirements, uh, the technical requirements. So um, to start, I mean, both the open and specific category um, have adopted the same approach. We are uh, looking at the risk of a certain operation and we try to define proportionate mitigation measures, either requirements on the pilot operator or technical requirements on the drone. And also it is very important to understand that in many cases we have tried to balance the requirement uh, between the technical requirements on the drone and the requirements on, on the pilot. For instance, if you impose uh, that a kid needs a certificate to play with a toy, we you will kill the toys market. So we didn't impose anything on the pilot for a toy, <laughs> but we put some technical requirements on the drone, which basically, in the case of toys, are already covered by the toys directive. Now, what is the big difference between open and specific that was already mentioned? It is basically the, um, it is basically the way the compliance of the, uh, of the drone with the technical requirement 
uh, imposed on the drone is achieved. In the specific category, we have the uh, authorization uh, of the uh, aviation authority, which covers this um, compliance. This is why the technical requirements for the drones operating in the specific category, you will find them either in the standard scenarios or in the authorization itself. Now, in the specific category, we say we don't need prior authorization. So we to ensure the compliance of the product used with the requirements of the scenarios we will be in the open category, we needed another process. And in fact, we use a process which already applies to drones, which is the C-marking, because there is already a number of technical requirements applying on the drone and on for which the manufacturer has to apply the C-marking. So uh, this we, we use the C-marking and uh, uh, to ensure the compliance basically with the requirements you find in Appendix 1. Now, as already mentioned, I think by Eve, there is another big ch uh, difference between the two. In the for the manufacturer point of view, in the open category, the one which is finally um, responsible for the compliance of the product use uh, with the technical requirement is the operator, while in the open category, the one who is responsible for the compliance of the product put on the market with a certain class uh, is the manufacturer. And that's very, uh, I think, important as well. Now. Um, how did we, ha let's have a closer look to the open category. How did we define the uh, requirements from uh, uh, the technical requirements there? But basically, we defined three uh, basic scenarios as presented before. Uh, we call them subcategories, but we could also call them scenarios as in the open category. One, you can fly over people. One, you need to keep a certain distance from people. And the third one is you have to stay away far from people. Um, and then we try to find a balance between the restriction we impose on the drone. And this is basically by assigning which type of drone can fly under which scenario, which uh, opera sub subcategory. Um, and the, the requirement we impose on the pilot or on the product. And to do that, it was very important, very, very useful for us, the, the work done with the within the impact assessment, because this is where we uh, try to collect through reviews and to analyze uh, the impact of the technical requirements we would impose on the drone in terms of uh, affordability, in terms of feasibility, but also uh, on the market, because sometimes, as I said, uh, putting higher requirement uh, or more technical requirement on the drone would, but still very little requirement on the pilot would open, uh, for instance, the toys market. So that was this balance that was also done uh, through the uh, analysis and the work done in the impact assessment. So finally, we fi we, we, we define the technical requirement uh, for each of the operational category, for each of the scenario, if you want, in the open category, focusing on the specific challenge of a scenario, flying over people. But of course, the first risk is uh, to uh, injuries uh, on people. Now, this is very limited because we allow only very light drones there, but still the requirements are focusing on uh, mitigating uh, injuries in case of impact on people, like, in for instance, uh, no sharp edge or kinetic energy. Now, for the uh, class where we ask to stay at a safety distance from people, uh, there again, we have limited the weight of the drones that can do that. But of course, what is important is to ensure that people can effectively, uh, technically stay at that st safe distance. So the focus was on uh, mitigating the loss of control. Uh, if you are flying at 20 meters, you need to be sure that you can maintain this 20 meter uh, safety distance. And for instance, there are requirements like loss link management or me mechanical integrity, which allows you to keep uh, the master, to, to stay the master of your drone. And for the f uh, third category, where we say drones have to stay very far from people, there uh, there is much less technical requirements. Um, these requirements you find in Appendix 1, uh, as I said, will be implemented through the C-marking. Uh, C-marking is a classical approach uh, for many types of product. You have, uh, and we call this basically harmonization legislation. You have for toys, you have for lists, you have for machinery, you have for radio equipment, and so on. Now, uh, you will find 
and we were it was needed to build a new uh, harmonization legislation for drone into this regulation because for each of the products you want to regulate with the C marking you need to build a new one which is based on a template I will show you so it's basically the text is basically always the same but you need to to build it to create it so this standard text you find it in annex 2 and it applies to the requirements of the drone able to operate in the open category you find in ap appendix 1 so annex 2 plus appendix 1 at the end creates a new harmonization legislation for drones um, we could have create a directive out of this regulation uh, that would not have made sense because of the close let's say link between the technical requirements and the operation and the other requirements on pilot and all this so this is why you find it it, it here um, now um, we have we have as i said from the manufacturer point of view you have already a number of directives you have to comply especially i want to insist the radio equipment directive a lot of uncompliance has been found on the use of spectrum uh, and the authorities member states authorities are not very happy at the moment with the situation with drones so be careful now the manufacturer can decide he, he wants to uh, to address the market of the open category then he knows that he, he has to comply not only with the general requirements that applies to all drones but in addition to the new requirements which are defined in this regulation then it, 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 it add this regulation to the list of the re regulation he complies with and he has to decide which category he wants to design his drone of he, he, he at the end it is the manufacturer who decides which category he wants to name its drone basically a drone of 800 grams is not obliged to be a c2 it could be identified as a c3 provided it complies with all the requirements with the c3 now there was a question about is there a possibility to put many marks i don't know if that makes much sense in eventually if it complies to all the, the 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 technical requirements why not but i think the main thing is that a manufacturer decide which uh, drone it I, I, um, which ca which class it can use uh, according to the market he want to address now if he does not want to address the open then he will uh, has still have to comply with the directive the other ones will not comply with the open category requirements he will not affix uh, a logo of a class identification and then this drone will be used in specific cannot be used in open so uh, that's be the same basically to say that when there is this logo you can buy and fly the, the, the drone according to the rules of that class uh, as I said there is a lot of technical requirements already applying on drones I insist this is already there and should be complied with and there is a standard I would say a template for all these regulations. this if you read the annex 2 you will see that 90 percent is similar to the, the text of this other regulation which applies on the drone it is a standard approach um, but still we have to put it in the regulation so how does it work the regulation has to uh, basically define two things first the technical requirement they have to be in the regulation they cannot be in amc's so this is why at the end the open category is much more let's say complex because in the open category the three scenarios are completely defined while for the specific the scenarios will be in amc's or will be in the authorization um, and then the regulation defines the conformity assessment so the procedure we uh, provide to the manufacturer to do this um, conformity assessment the conformity assessment has to be done by the manufacturer or the importer this is important uh, in case of uh, Chinese man manufacturer for instance the importer might uh, be uh, the one doing the conformity assessment uh, we provide the, the different ways to do now in some cases where the we think the risk is higher we mandate the intervention of a third party the so-called notified body notified body are well defined in the regulation there was a question about notified body and uh, qualified identity i would say there are two different type of regulation defining rather well who are these um, entities um, i don't know if there is an equivalence possible uh, or if it's easy to do what a member states could do is to uh, uh, declare a notified body i mean the same comp the same organization 
uh, as notified body and qualify entity that would certainly uh, be feasible because member states have to uh, i mean have to notify these this, this bodies um, and then very important this procedure may be f facilitated by the use of harmonized standard um, basically we can the regulator can choose between basically 16 type of, um, of, of, of modules but um, at the end, in the regulation, we provide normally for two or three uh, s different ways. The one we have put in the regulation, but we can adjust them, and the comment would be very welcome from industry, are the ones which are already used for other applicable uh, directive, like the radio equipment directive, to facilitate, if the procedure is the same, it would facilitate, I would say, the life of a manufacturer. Basically, these three um, different ones. The first one, module A, is a simple one where the manufacturer can do a self-declaration, of course, based on a technical file and all the tests and whatever he needs to do to demonstrate the conformity. The last one is the same, but in K, I mean, but there we ask the manufacturer or we limit it to manufacturer which run a quality assurance system, an ISO 19.1, for instance, which is approved by a notified body. And in between, we have a bit of more complex in two steps. First, a notified body um, declare the conformity of the design of the product with the requirement, and then the manufacturer ensure the conformity of the produced product with the design. So these are the three we have uh, proposed now. I will not enter into the details, I have no time, because um, Eve is uh, hanging his uh, two minutes, okay? So you see that when we um, have very low requirements, C0 when complying with the Toys Directive and C4, there is very little requirements, we the, the simple declaration is enough. When there is a bit higher requirement, we uh, consider that we should um, impose the intervention of a not notified body either through the EC type examination or through the um, audit of the quality insurance. Now there is an alternative to that. In case of standards, then we, um, we can, uh, if, if a manufacturer uses harmonized standards covering all the requirements, then we can come back to the easy one, which is the self-declaration. So, uh, but we cannot use any kind of standard. We need to use harmonized, European harmonized standard published in the uh, journal, uh, uh, official journal. And they would then provide presumption of conformity. An harmonized standard is a standard we see which is adopted by one of the three European yes, uh, standardization organization, SEN, SENELEC, or ETSI, anybody else, uh, no, nobody else, uh, on the basis of a mandate drafted and adopted by DigiGro or another DG. In this case, we will do it. So we will have to draft and, and, and adopt, uh, um, the Commission will have to adopt a mandate. And from that mandate, these three organizations can decide to work on it, and then they would deliver the um, standard, and that's not the end. Then the Commission, in a way, has to assess if it indeed it fits, it provides the presumption of conformity for the requirements is, is supposed to cover and then we publish it to the uh, official journal. In this case, the use of the standard would allow the manufacturer to go from the complex uh, procedure involving notified body to the simple one, the self-declaration. Um, my last slide, just to say that we have, uh, I answered two questions already, so <laughs> can uh, some additional time. <laughs> so <laughs> um, we see that, uh, in the appendix one, we have a number of requirements. Uh, we see, in any case, the need for uh, harmonized standard on identification and geofencing or geo-information, as I think Cesar mentioned it, which is more correct, probably. Um, but eventually, for all the other classes as well. Um, so we will have, from now on, to I would say, through the end of the year, 
to work on the preparation of the mandates. That means also probably in some cases refining the requirement. I think for instance on identification where I think the security dimension is very important. We cannot leave it out otherwise there would be countries like France where you would have two systems, the European one and the French one because the European one does not answer the requirement of the French uh, security authority. And uh, then indeed there was a question about the timing. I think if we manage to adopt the mandate for instance in parallel with the adoption of the regulation then we would have three to, 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 to keep the three year uh, let's say uh, uh, mentioned in the article 15 then really the development of the standard would have to be very fast 18 months 24 months to leave the time to the industry to still adapt the product um, and there I really rely to a joint effort from all organization already working on standards to support the one at CNLEC, CNLEC that would have taken over the job to develop the standard and contribute in a common effort to get the standard very fast. So thank you very much. If I hey Jean-Pierre, Jean thank you very much. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to say that uh, we are archiving questions, but we are not deleting questions. So all the questions that didn't get an answer and they have been given through Slido, will receive an answer uh, through a document of answer that we will publish on our website. Then we can go to the, to the question. The first one, Jean-Pierre, if you can give an answer about... Yeah, I will not go in details. The, this, is a, this is a classical uh, process which uh, is used for all the directive we have. Uh, so uh, the at the end they have to, to prove that they are uh, compliant according to some standard we have and the um, national uh, notification body, I mean authority will then uh, declare them and present them as, as, as capable. Okay. It's a classical, I think those body know probably very well the candidate knows very well how, how it works. I can address this question about subcategorization that consider ground risk and what about the air risk. Uh, in the subcategorization we consider, uh, for example, visual line of sight limitation is a typical uh, factor that takes into consideration air risk, uh, the limitation in, uh, in, in altitude, uh, the buffer that we consider for the altitude between the 400 feet allowed and the 500 feet. Um, and the altitude limiter, yes, correct, Eve, also the altitude limiter. So there are some factors in the subcategorization in terms of limitation and function that consider the air risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, on, on, on the next question, I, I, I think we would need to look in detail if that makes uh, really sense. As I said, uh, for instance, if, uh, a g uh, I will not say, um, I forgot now the name of the last uh, DJI product, but <laughs> uh, a drone of 80, 80, 800 grams does not necessarily have to be uh, qualified as a C2. You might decide that because of the market opportunity, because perhaps an, a number of member states restrict very much the, the, the A2 operation, you decide you, 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 you put it on the market as a, as a C3, for instance. Um, Having both mark, f I think we need to reflect, but I think let's see if it makes any sense. As it was made clear before, A1 means you can fly up to over the people, but you can also fly, of course, far from people. A2, you, you may keep a safety distance, but you can, of course, uh, fly far from people. Um, so I'm not sure there will be a concrete case. If there is really one, then we, we need to look at. What is important is that the manufacturer can decide, and it's not because you drone weight 800 grams that it will be automatically be a C2. You have to decide on the based on the market opportunity you see. Okay, Stefan, if you can answer that. Okay, okay. The, the question is on, on regular BV loss operation in controlled airspace, and this has a need to adapt the rules of the air on ICAO level, and probably if we would have to wait until this will happen. We, I think we have replied to that question more or less already, uh, highlighting the flexibility we have in, in CERA to authorize uh, operations in controlled aerospace, aerospace. And of course there are developments in ICAO for regular international BV loss operation which will take some time to develop. 
Okay, so let's address the this question: uh, Why do only C3, C4 have to keep a safe distance from aerodromes and not C1, C2, knowing that they are allowed to fly until 120 meters? So for uh, for the uh, for the safety of the aerodromes, um, yeah, we don't make any distinction between uh, C3, C4, C1, C2. I hope that uh, my presentation did not lead uh, this kind of interpretation. Uh, there will be the, the member states will identify no flight zone, no, so no uh, drone zone or limited drone zone, and they will co-protect the aerodromes. So still, uh, uh, drones will not be able to fly unless they are authorized close to aerodrome, uh, whatever is their category. Okay, so we would like to switch uh, to a question from the public. Thank you very much. My name is Christian Schleifer from Eurok. Uh, we have seen the requirements uh, on what kind of standards you want to use, which is very, very prescriptive compared to the whole rule, which should be open and proportional. So we would like to see, first of all, we understand that there are two worlds merging now, the aviation world and the world you are coming from with the CE marking. But in the aviation, we have good experience with other standard-making body, which you would okay. exclude with this kind of very stringent requirement. So maybe there is a better way and a more modern way we can use, also making best use of the resources uh, available in the industry and uh, developing standards. So we have very good examples and in EASA just recently, developing standards for small aircraft on part 23 developed by ASTM, an American standardization organization. So why not using it for drones as well? So don't make it too small, too stringent, too prescriptive, leave it open and take the best uh, uh, standards available on the market and use the um, resources efficiently here. Uh, I may take that one. Um, I said to simplify the uh, procedure, the C marking procedure, we need to we need to uh, use harmonized standard. That's no way way around. This does not apply only on drones, but on thousands and thousands on of product, including drones, by the way, for other requirements. Now, um, setting up these standards do not mean that we cannot use or refer to already existing standards, um, but not going the, the way of harmonized standard would just undermine the C-marking. We decided to use the C-marking because we did not want to impose aviation uh, um, authorization from aviation authority on the open category. Now, if you put that in question and you want to go back to uh, the need for having aviation uh, uh, authorization, I mean authorization from aviation authority to be used, to be able to use aviation standard, that's something else. But as soon we decide that we would not have aviation uh, authorization for the open and we still need something to make sure that the product are compliant, we have the C marking. And there, there is no way around. This is again nothing which, uh, which w this is applying already to drones and, and to many products. Uh, so this is we will not change. Um, but again, we can use already existing standards when they are good and, and, and applied. We have just to transform them. This is more than a kind of administrative procedure. Sense and Elec or Etsy can take the standards and, 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 and change them. I mean, make them applicable here. Okay, uh, uh, Marco Festa, uh, I would like to make another question because we are speaking uh, about uh, the object of the unmanned aircraft uh, as uh, not thinking about the complete life cycle. We are just thinking about uh, the object as coming from the industry, but this object can live years. Why uh, do, you do you not yet address the what is called in the aviation the continuing airworthiness part of this object and you just address the initial airworthiness. Is this because you think they have a very short life cycle or because you mm, do not yet uh, have uh, regulation about that? 
you have an idea of how address continuing airworthiness of this product and how assure the continuing airworthiness. Uh, we, we have some provisions in the NPA and uh, the responsibility is mainly uh, based on the operator pilot to ensure that the equipment is fit to fly and, and conforming to the CE marking and keeps conforming and, and, and in a safe condition, which is honestly not too far away from the uh, oversight regime we accept even for manned aircraft, where it's the operator, the pilot owner who defines a maintenance program and ensures safety. Olivier from Sapritalia. Ah, okay. Uh, just a question about uh, also somebody did the, the question on on the board with Slido. Um, the notifying body and the notified body have uh, specific rules uh, into the part of for the market uh, about, for example, a conflict of interest and, and stuff like this that we don't uh, see into the aeronautical part, if you want to give a definition about this. So uh, a qualified entity uh, don't have the same rules about the conflict of interest than a, a notifying body, for example. Uh, what's, what's about that? I think what you mean is that there are good rules for notified bodies that you would like to see in the aviation rules for uh, qualified entities. So I give the floor to the aviation <laughs> colleagues. <laughs> we, we have, uh, okay, I tried to answer briefly. Uh, we have in the basic regulation, there are criteria for the qualified entities. They are defined in an appendix. So, at the time being, I say, okay, we, we apply them. I don't imagine they are so different from the, from the notified body. But the problem we would have is that it is at a very high level. So I'm not sure how we can really change that. They are included into a document which is approved by the council and the parliament. So it may not be very easy to change it. I, um, I understand and uh, have a lot of sympathy for your question, but I'm not so sure how, how much we can we can change, that you can change that. Okay, but over there, maybe Bertrand, the last one. Thierry Salmon, uh, Airbus. Um, I'm coming back to the question about um, uh, having a, uh, drones close to aerodromes. And, and in fact, in the leaflet, it is uh, indeed written that uh, for all categories, they should stay away from aerodromes. But if you look in the NPA, only the C4, if I'm not mistaken, is requested to stay away from aerodromes. It's not even said in the general requirements for drones that they should stay away. So I think maybe something to, to be looked at uh, in the requirements. Uh, first, we, we definitely expect that uh, aerodromes, especially large aerodromes, are protected by zones and there's definitely a requirement to comply with, with uh, local conditions to respect uh, zones as, as defined. But when we have inconsistency, we will look into this and sh ensure that this is consistent. Okay. Yeah, I, I just want to, I mean, just looking on the panel there, you know, there are questions about the complexity. And, you know, this is, was a, always a discussion during the expand panel group. And I think for the category A1 and A2, we reached a very good compromise in terms of complexity. The category A3, however, is the real open category because it's that's where you can fly around pretty much everywhere. This is the equivalent part 107 and so on and so forth. We also heard from you, Jean-Pierre, that the use of CE marking is a very good way to address these product requirements. However, it comes with the need of very complex way of dealing it with it. You need to put all the requirements in the rule. You need to apply, you need to make markings. You need to have notified bodies. So the national authorities, not only the NAAs, but also the enforcement authorities for the product regulation have a lot of work to do. The implementation is not, let's say, at no cost. To me, I still believe that uh, when I look at the impact assessment and when I look at the evidence that has been provided so far for the need of the CE marking product requirements in the A3 category, the C3 and C4, I still find this evidence very, very weak. Also considering part 107, which is mentioned there, where none of this has been used and operations are very safe, considering the experience of many member states. So our comment from, let's say, NAA, but in general from those that are charged with the implementation of these rules, is to please 
really look if this is needed and to provide evidence that this is needed because it doesn't come for free. And, and I would really encourage you to do this analysis once more and more in detail because at the moment I find it relatively non-convincing, differently from C1 and C2, and th those it's very convincing, and I really agree on that. Probably you put in question more the content than the principle. Uh, of course, the amount of work or the burden is proportionate uh, to the amount of requirements we put. So there probably, okay, there is probably room for, for adapting the requirements. On the process itself, again, this process already applies to drones. We do not add an additional process. You have to comply and please do it with, <laughs> with the radio equipment directive on the use of spectrum and then electromagnetic interference. And there is a lot of problems with drones at the moment with that. So this process already applies. We do not invent a new process. So in terms of process, I think uh, we do not really add a very big burden. The burden may come then when we discuss the detailed requirement, okay, that something you can, can look at. The problem is not only linked to the CE marking. I think we, the question is more general than that. And we will receive comments. And we will see what kind of comments we received. And they may not always go into the same direction. This being said, we will make a thorough analysis of what we got. And if we have to improve, we will do. But uh, let's, let's, let's really it was agree it was a difficult discussion. I'm not surprised there will be reactions, but uh, I think it is in the general, uh, in the, we say the, the, the general sets of requirements, we will need to look at what we get, uh, what we get from comments, from authorities, from stakeholders, also from security authorities. We'll see what, uh, what we get. I would so perhaps li like to add uh, last comment we already made twice. One very good thing for the, for some of the operator, for some of the users of drones, the one which are really using the drone like a tool, the farmer that would eventually use the drone like a tractor, uh, is this uh, new distribution we have in the open on the responsibility of the compliance of the drone, which in many cases might be also very useful to open market. So uh, I want to highlight that because it's different from the open category and different type of users. Yeah. We take two more questions quickly. I saw, uh, I saw Bertrand from GSC okay. and then Peter Hi. from, uh, from uh, UVS International. So Bertrand first. A very, a very specific question, uh, Jean-Pierre. In fact, yeah. <laughs> it's about the applicability of the radio equipment directive, the yes. red directive. We are on, um, my understanding on is the way to solve it. Yeah, my <laughs> understanding, maybe you, you can answer easily. My understanding is that it's applicable today to the drones because they are not in the scope of the basic regulation. And it will But with remain. the revised basic regulation... And, and it, it should it remain. So my, I have my colleague on my back every day. And so I try to be on the back of the gym. So you, you confirm yeah, that it no, will be applicable? Indeed, indeed. Okay. The only question is the, um, the scope. That was a question which was difficult from the very beginning. There is, I think, a discussion tomorrow between the colleagues in EASA my colleagues in DG Grow responsible for the directive. But the philosophy is that, of course, we want to keep it applicable. The only question is about eventually those drones which are certified and if the certification process eventually cover the same, let's say, requirements, we might, we might uh, uh, let's say, exclude them. But of course, for the consumer product where the main non-compliance exists, the idea is to introduce a modification in the basic regulation of the, of the red directive to correct this uh, fluid we have at the moment and keep the applicability of the red directive on those products. Peter? Uh, Jean-Pierre, this concerns the, uh, the standards. Sen, yep. Senelec, uh, Etsy. You mentioned 18 months for that process. At least, honestly. <laughs> At least. Honestly. Uh, we're not even there yet uh, because uh, the mandate hasn't been created. So uh, if this process is, is going to be put into action, what are we looking at? 2021, 22, 20. As I said, this 18 months was for me a bit of a, a, a try to say the Article 15 at the moment says that uh, 
three years after the adoption of the regulation, uh, all operations should comply with the with the with the uh, with the with the new regulation. So the Article 15 put a three years period, and I said, okay, if we want to have in three years after three years after the uh, publication all drones put on the market compliant with the new rules, yes. then indeed we would we could not have more than 18, 24 months for the standard and then leave one year or whatever for the industry to adapt the production to the new standards. Okay. Uh, it's challenging. It was not, it's more to, okay, to look at what is the challenge ahead of us if we want to keep these three years which are in the Article 15. Thank, thank you, Jean-Pierre. I, I think we will need to have a a good discussion on that particular item because we have a we have clearly uh, uh, targets which are uh, perhaps not fully compatible with that. So we we'll need to find uh, we we'll need perhaps to be to be creative. And on this last word, I would like to propose that we close this morning session and go back to to lunch. We are a little bit late, but if you could be back at uh, say five minutes after one thirty, that would be great. Thank you very much.